Welcome everyone to this uh, session on uh, blockchain technology. My name is uh, Michael Kornbrander. I work as a solution architect at Capgemini and have been working uh, with this technology for, uh, for about six, seven years now. Uh, usually when I uh, do a talk on this subject, I always start with a bit of a crowd question to see what, what the familiarity uh, with, uh, with what we're going to show uh, is. So uh, by raise of hands, could you uh, tell me who of you is, uh, would say they're quite familiar with, with, uh, with blockchain technology? Raise of hands. Okay, that's not, not, not that much. But uh, the idea is to change that a little bit. We're going to look at the, the, the process underlying the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, so many people are entering now. Let's give them uh, a minute to sit down. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so again, by raise of hands, who here owns uh, a little bit or a bit more? Uh, who here owns Bitcoin? Ah, those are a lot of more hands, but you don't know what the technology is. <laughs> uh, that's okay, that's okay. Of course, Bitcoin is doing quite well. Today, uh, today it actually passed another all-time high, uh, around $7,000, 6,000 euros. So there's, there's going to be a, a big change in the network somewhere this month. So we can expect a lot of volatility in the network and in, in the price accordingly. So what we're, talking, what we're going to talk about is, is mining. And that is, uh, well, the, the, the key feature that enables the Bitcoin network. Uh, I brought uh, two uh, old miners to, to show you uh, uh, what, what this hardware looks uh, like. Sadly, we cannot uh, uh, actually mine here because uh, the Bitcoin network is untrusted over here. So we cannot access the network, sadly. But we're going we're gonna to show uh, how it works anyway. These are uh, uh, some old miners. They used to mine about one Bitcoin a day. Um, today, you, 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 you could be happy if you, if you get close to one uh, over a year. The, 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 these kind of hardware setups have been evolving quite rapidly. Um, these things are mainly... Uh, uh, deterministic CPUs, so they only do one thing and they do it really well, and that is to calculate hashes. So we're going we're gonna to see how the Bitcoin network uh, uses these hashing uh, functions to secure the network. And uh, the, the, the key element in securing the Bitcoin blockchain are these machines that are running uh, all over the world. So welcome everyone. My name is uh, Michael Kornbrander. I work as a solution architect for Capgemini. Um, since last year, we started a, a, a practice uh, solely dedicated to, to researching and implementing these technologies. So blockchain, distributed ledger technology, is more of the overarching term that has been used lately uh, since the technology is also being leveraged by, by corporate and enterprise uh, 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 companies. And they implemented, uh, implemented a little bit differently. But today we're only going to focus on the Bitcoin network because it was the first uh, blockchain and network. And we're going to specifically focus on the aspect of mining. So yeah, this is a bit of info about me, my fields of expertise. I'm currently working at um, one of the Dutch banks to see how we can leverage these new innovative technologies in combination with things like AI and uh, machine learning to create a new kind of core banking system. I've been responsible for a project called White Flag, which Capgemini has, uh, um, has built in cooperation with the Royal Dutch Air Force, where we use pub uh, public blockchain uh, networks to uh, build a communication network on top of these uh, uh, blockchain uh, layers uh, for conflict and disaster zones, so to, uh, to facilitate secure communications in, in places where uh, networks are untrusted, where parties are untrusted. And uh, well, I've been responsible for designing several proof of concepts um, using this technology. I've been an uh, early adopter. I've been in the ecosystem about 2010 when I uh, uh, befriended the IT guy, 
came up to me, Michael, you need to see this Bitcoin. It's revolutionary. Uh, it's going to change the world. Well, opinions vary on uh, whether it's a hype, uh, a bubble, or actually uh, something like the new internet. Um, we're not going to delve into these discussions today, but I am going, uh, at least I hope, I will be able to show you what makes Bitcoin uh, unique and what, what, what was the fuss in, uh, uh, when, this, uh, when this network arrived on the scene and what, what makes it different from everything that came before. So, uh, yeah, we're going to look at the Bitcoin before. I, I take it everyone is familiar with Bitcoin here, right? Cryptocurrency, it's a, it's a store of value, it's a digital asset. It can be used for other things as well, but basically uh, you can compare it to a digital form of gold. It's often compared to that because it's, it's limited um, and can be used as a store of asset, a store of value. So it all began in 2008, late 2008, around October, when uh, uh, someone going by uh, the pseudonymous name of Satoshi Nakamoto, released this white paper. We're going to read the abstract a little bit later. And he proposed a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. And uh, that's, that's where Bitcoin uh, did something that no other uh, solution did before. And that's that you can uh, transact on a network without having a third party to manage the the ordering and the finality of the, of the transactions on the network. So just really high over to start with, why is Bitcoin different? Well, on the left you see centralized networks, and they have a, a central authority that manages the, 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 the validity and, and, and the, the, the addition of data to the database. And in the Bitcoin network, we, uh, there is something called distributed consensus. There's no middleman, there's no third party anymore. It's just the network itself that manages the validity and the ordering and the addition of data to the database. As you all probably know, uh, a blockchain is basically a database that is created by multi multiple parties at once. And this is what Bitcoin does. And the management of, the, of everything, that uh, all the data that uh, travels across the network is managed by the network itself. And we're going we're gonna to see how the network uh, does that. So centralized networks have permissioned access. And that means that you know, they're, uh, they're someone that you have to uh, sign up with. And they have to approve you as a participant on the network. And in Bitcoin, it's anyone can join. You can just uh, download the software implementation, run it. It's available on, on, on all uh, popular OSs. It's open source, it's free, and it's permissionless. So there's no bank, there's no company anywhere in the middle that you have to provide any credentials to before you can join the network. So anyone can join the network. And this has several consequences, and one of them is that probably you will have untrusted agents on your network. And probably you will also have a couple of bad actors on your network that are, try to rig the system, try to, to attack the system, hack the system. Uh, Bitcoin has been under attack ever since its inception. I mean, there's money to be to to be gotten, right? If you if you if you are the one who manages to uh, to break the cryptography, for instance, or or, or 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 fool the network in some way, you might have a, a monetary reward that's quite substantial. There are several billion dollars going around in this network, so uh, attackers are drawn to this. And what is um, what is interesting is that Bitcoin has never been compromised uh, on a network level. I mean, enough people have gotten their private keys stolen or missing. Uh, you've heard about uh, there, there's a way to, to store your private keys on, on a piece of paper. There are many stories uh, that piece of paper got eaten up by a dog. So th you can lose money in all kinds of ways, but actual on a, on, a, on a network level, the network has never been compromised and it has been running, well, ever since it's been turned on. Um, centralized networks are often proprietary. No, you don't know what's actually going on in the software. And Bitcoin is completely open source, so everyone can check what the software does when transactions and when money is being uh, transacted. Some financial parameters are in light blue on the slide that are uh, quite interesting to know. Um, uh, Bitcoin has a capped issuance. 
And what does that mean? That means that there will be only 21 million bitcoins in circulation. They, uh, they, they enter circulation by being mined. We're going to show that a, a bit later. But there will never be more than 21 million bitcoins. And as you might know from uh, fiat currencies like uh, dollars, euros, there, there's no limit to the amount of units that can be produced. And actually, new units are being produced uh, each year. And this amount only increases. So where Bitcoin is a deflationary currency, uh, other uh, most traditional currencies are inflationary. So this means that the number of Bitcoin to represent the value in the network will always be the same. So right now there's about $100 billion in the Bitcoin network. And if you divide them by, uh, I believe, about 18 million are in circulation. Um, and that's how you get the, 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 the price. Yeah, it's 6,000 euros, 7,000 dollars. But you can imagine as more money pours into this ecosystem, this same value that is increasing can only be represented by that same limited amount of Bitcoin. There will never be more than 21 million. So, uh, yeah, this has really interesting uh, economic effects. And, uh, well, in comparison to our, uh, re uh, our, uh, our regular um, monetary systems, um, this is something really different. Normally we have inflation. And with Bitcoin you have deflation. So it's, you know, it, you, couldn't, you can't expect that it, uh, well, at least the value might increase. It can only be represented by the same number of, uh, of units. And there are uh, um, other, other attempts to try and to uh, use what Bitcoin uh, uh, did. Huh? Blockchain technology, as it's called, it's, it's quite a hype uh, at the moment. And a lot of companies are experimenting with it. And uh, many implementations um, uh, form a private network. So they are called private ledgers. We're going to look into that a bit more uh, in the next slide. And Bitcoin is a public ledger, so that means that uh, all the transactions that are sent across the network are store, stored in the blockchain. And this is an open, open database. Everyone can, can look at it and you can see each and every transaction that happened since its inception. It's kind of a glass books uh, system. So achieving consensus. I don't know how many uh, of you are uh, familiar with distributed computing. But um, this in itself is, is, is not a new, new idea to create databases together. I mean, uh, even though a lot of databases are you know, centrally created and then copied to many places, and then you have to reconcile, is our data still the same? Uh, which version do you have? Which version do I have? Um, there are many benefits of creating databases together. Uh, one of them is that you have no need for reconciliation anymore. But before Bitcoin, it was not possible to do, that, do this in a fully decentralized fashion. As you can see here, um, all, the, all the solutions so far have always had um, a permission system. So that means that there were always nodes that were specifically appointed to make sure all the transactions are processed uh, correctly. So uh, on the left you see, for instance, Puxels. It's a really famous... Uh, um, uh, distributed uh, uh, computing algorithm to, to create uh, data sets together. Uh, Raft has also, uh, also quite, uh, been there for quite some years. Uh, Corda and Fabric are new platforms. Corda is a platform created by a banking consortium called R3. Um, about 70 of the, of the, uh, of the world's uh, larger banks are a part of this consortium and they've created the, the, the platform Corda. And Fabric is, is a similar uh, kind of idea, also a platform created by IBM. But these networks are fundamentally different from the Bitcoin network in the sense that they still have uh, designated nodes that are uh, responsible for making the system run correctly. So as you can see on the left, you also uh, you have validator nodes and member nodes. And on the left, you have member nodes that are not allowed to do their own entries in, this, in, in these databases. In Bitcoin, however, and in uh, well, uh, public blockchain systems, as they are also called, it's fully decentralized. Everyone can run a node, and if you run a node, you are all also a validator, and uh, you can also uh, add data to the ledger. So how did Bitcoin 
manage to solve this? Well, these miners, mining is the key to that. So I hope that after today, you have a good idea and what, what the Bitcoin networks, uh, what makes the Bitcoin network fundamentally different from uh, uh, other solutions that have been there before and other solutions that are being developed uh, now. So as you can see, Bitcoin network is a global network. Um, there are all kinds of actors. There are Bitcoin owners. There are exchanges where you can uh, buy and sell Bitcoin for other cryptocurrencies or for euros or for dollars. Uh, there are merchants that offer uh, customers to be able to pay uh, uh, using these cryptocurrencies. And um, this is fully open, fully open source. Everyone can join. Everyone can run a node. Everyone can create an address, uh, start, start a Bitcoin account, and, and start using this software. So to give a little bit of context, uh, Bitcoin is a revolutionary, maybe. Let's, let, let's see what has, been, uh, what has been done before. Because the idea of a digital currency that is decentralized is not new. There have been various serious attempts at this, uh, Hashcash is, uh, is an example by Adam Beck in 2002. Uh, Bitgold by Nick Sabo. He's, uh, he's quite a famous guy in the, in, in the IT world for his work also on smart contracts. And uh, B-Money was also an attempt uh, to create a fully decentralized uh, digital currency. But there was also always a fundamental problem that these networks could not solve. And that is how can you know that if I send a transaction over there, that I do not send the same units, the same coins, at the same time to someone else. How would the network know that I'm doing this at the same time? And this is what you call the double spending problem. And for this reason, there were always validator nodes in the network that were assigned with this specific task. So the middleman basically decides which transactions go through and which not. So in Bitcoin, this happens quite differently. So, Bitcoin was created at a, at a quite a, a, a specific time, a time full of financial tension. As you all might, might remember, 2008 was the year of the big financial crash. And end of 2008, Bitcoin arrived to the scene as a, as a, as a, well, as a way to, to exchange value without institutions being uh, necessary anymore and encoded in the very first Bitcoin transaction and this is the first block uh, transactions are put into blocks that's why we call it the blockchain um, the times 3 January 2009 Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks so this is a message that the creator of Bitcoin put in this very first block uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and uh, well it can be might be interpretable in multiple ways but it addresses, it, it addresses the financial system quite directly. So Bitcoin uh, sort of uh, grew out of the cypherpunk scene. For those of you who are familiar with that, people are uh, a group of people that are very adamant of preserving privacy on the internet and preserving freedom on the internet. So Bitcoin came out of, came out of this context and was also closely related to the financial crash in 2008. So this is, the, this is the very first block. You see there is one transaction. That's only the Coinbase transaction. Um, I do not seem to be able to scroll here. Excuse me. Let's try it like this. Okay, this also doesn't work. Excuse me. Well, in the, in the metadata, uh, of this uh, of this block um, was this message uh, encoded in hex uh, this message uh, uh, addressing the banks so the mag magic behind Bitcoin is actually mining this the miners are what makes it possible to have a fully decentralized system and the, the miners uh, perform specific operations in order to ensure that uh, transactions are put into the database correctly and that there are no double spends and that all transactions meet the requirements of the Bitcoin protocol. So let's look at mining a bit closer. We're going we're gonna to start a, a, a short movie showing a, um, 
a secret uh, Chinese mining farm. Um, even though we cannot show these machines, these were the, the machines that we used in about 2010, 2011. And as I said, uh, each of these could mine about one Bitcoin a day. But as time progressed, uh, the computing power of these machines uh, increased quite dramatically. And uh, in the next movie, uh, I would just so show a, a small piece to give you a sense of the scale of, uh, uh, of these machines, how they are uh, being used today. So let's hope it works. I've tried to embed the video in, in the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it doesn't seem to... Okay, then we're going to do it differently. Let's see. You can see that, right? Yeah. Are you all using a lot of internet at the moment? <laughs> of course. Do we have sound on the HDMI? <coughs> okay, it's quite slow. Uh, apologies, people. But it is worth it to see. Okay, there's no sound over HDMI? Can you hear the noise? These machines make a lot of noise because they get really, really hot. So you see, this is a professional operation. This is a facility that's wholly dedicated to mining Bitcoin. Okay, so you see the scale is quite different from guys like me, you know, using laptops or these machines to guys like, uh, like over there that just have one giant facility full of these machines. So uh, the, the guy in the movie already said they're racing to solve a puzzle on the internet. And that's kind of true. These miners are performing calculations uh, in order to find a specific answer that allows them to be the one that creates the next Bitcoin block. So let's just see the abstract. This is actually quite technical, but it's always good to start at the origin of things. And this is the, the first uh, paragraph of the Bitcoin white paper. And uh, let's just read through it because it's actually quite, quite, uh, quite good to understand. So Bitcoin is a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash. And it would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. And digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. And the longest, the longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as the ma majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. 
The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best effort basis and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work chain as proof what happened while we're gone. Okay, so it might not be clear directly what it does, but basically it, you need CPU power. And these things are just CPU powers. And these things do one thing, and that is hash functions. It's a SHA-256 hash function, and that's all these machines can do. You cannot run an operating system on these miners. They are just monofunctional. They just hash. And this hash power makes sure that the data is entered correctly into the blockchain. And we're, try we're going to look at how exactly these miners do this. So the, the proof of work is what the consensus mechanism is called. There are multiple uh, consensus mechanisms. Uh, there is also proof of stake, for instance, but that's outside the scope of, of this talk today. But uh, a blockchain system that uses CPU-based mining or GPU-based mining um, um, is called proof of work. And the puzzle for the miners to find is a double SHA-256 hash value for six items in the block header. So each block in the blockchain has a block header and a block body. And in the block body, there are the transactions. And they hash these blocks. And they are looking for a certain value. And it's actually quite simple. They just, there's a difficulty value. So it, 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 it gets difficult, more difficult, uh, as more CPU power joins the network. And they are just looking for a value that starts with a certain number of zeros. So that might not make sense directly. But if you look at the cryptographic algorithm, uh, it's, it's actually quite hard to find a value like that. And you need to perform CPU cycles. So if there is a valid block, it's proven that a certain number of CPU cycles have been expended. So a hash value that forms a solution is called the proof of work, as this solution could only have been found by expending significant effort. So let's look at the protocol a little bit. The Bitcoin protocol is basically uh, the rules of the network, the rules how it operates. So there is verification of transactions, and a transaction is verified if the initiator of the transaction is entitled to the funds. So that is if you are in possession of the private key corresponding with, with the Bitcoins. And are there enough funds available? Because the Bitcoin network does not allow negative balances. So you cannot spend anything you don't have. So as this is verified, the transaction uh, needs to be validated. And this is what miners do. A uh, transaction is validated whenever it receives a stamp of approval and is entered into the ledger. So this is where miners come in. Now, a transaction is secured whenever it's been registered long enough in the blockchain. So in Bitcoin, blocks are created periodically. And uh, the idea is to have a new block each 10 minutes. It's, you could kind of Look at it like the heartbeat of the network. So transactions are sent, and they are pooled in the memory pool, and miners pick transactions from this memory pool, put them in a block, and start hashing, looking for, for, for this specific value that has a certain number of zeros. And when they find it, they, can, they have created a valid block, and they relay this block to the rest of the network, and they will see it is a valid block. And why do these miners do this? Well, if you create a valid block as a miner, you receive the mining reward. So that's, that's the incentive structure that, uh, that makes Bitcoin work. You know, people are not just going to leverage CPU power, which costs a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, that, that mining farm you saw just now, I believe it has a bill of about $80,000 a month just for ele electricity. Um, so it's quite expensive. So why do these miners do it? Because they can earn the mining reward. Um, in 2008, uh, 2009, this reward was 50 Bitcoin for each block you created. And this parameter all uh, halves, uh, so, so decreases over time. So it, it has halved to 25 Bitcoin per block. And currently, it is 12 and a half Bitcoin per block. So Bitcoin has several incentive structures. To, uh, to allow for the network to scale. This is a scaling parameter uh, as, as more CPU power uh, uh, gets added to the network. And as the price increases, uh, the reward is lowered. And this is a kind of a balancing of incentives. 
because miners uh, uh, need to be incentivized to actually uh, uh, deliver the CPU power. Um, and they will only do it if they get the reward for it. So let's look at some cryptographic principles. We're going to get a little bit technical here, but I, I try to uh, compose it in such a way that it should be uh, clear to everyone. And we're going to do some hashing uh, a little bit later on, and you will see the effects of changing something in the database immediately. So first there's public key cryptography. Uh, Bitcoin works with public keys and private keys. And it's actually quite, quite simple. The public key is your bank account number. You can share it with everyone you want. And uh, this is your address. This, this is where you can receive Bitcoin. So if I give you my public key, uh, that is my Bitcoin address, you know where you could send Bitcoins if you want to send them to me. And in order to be able to spend Bitcoins, you need the corresponding private key. So for that, Bitcoin uses a key pair generator. So you have a large random input can be anything, can be of any size. It's put into the key pair generator, and out of the key pair generator comes a public key and a private key. <coughs> so it generates an address, and a, well, if, if you would compare it to your bank account, it would be your PIN number. So without this number, you cannot send any funds away. And what is interesting is that these, uh, uh, the cryptography behind this makes it impossible to calculate the original input from both the private key and the public key, but it's also impossible to calculate the private key from the public key. And this is something you need, right? Because the public key is what I give to you if, you, if, I, want to be, uh, if, if I want to be able to receive Bitcoin. So if you could calculate my password out of this public key, we would have a problem and the network would not work. So this is one of the, one of the characteristics of public key cryptography that it's impossible at least with the current computational paradigm to, uh, to calculate the private key from the public key. So if you want to spend Bitcoin, you use a private key. And if you want to receive Bitcoin, you hand out your, your, your public key. A second cryptographic principle in this network is cryptographic hash functions. So what is this? It's basically, again, a random input of any length you want, and that we call message M. We put that into the hash function and it will uh, give us a hash value h of a fixed length. Uh, often it's uh, 32 characters, 32 bytes. Uh, and it's impossible to calculate the original input from this hash value. So each unique value m produces a unique value h. This is, that is one of the uh, characteristics. It's impossible to calculate m uh, from h. And computation time is practical for the de desired usage. So in order for a hash function to be, uh, to be called a cryptographic hash function, it needs to uh, adhere to these uh, three uh, things you see in the right uh, lower corner. That's collision resistance. And that means that if I um, put in an unlimited amount of different values, it should never produce the second hash twice. So it doesn't matter what you put in it, each unique input will have a unique output. And it's always of this fixed length. So you could have any data set, you could put it through the hash function and get a fixed, a fixed set of, of, of characters. So if I give you this set of data and you perform the same hash function, you should get the same fixed length string of characters. So it's a really easy way uh, to, to, to check data uh, with each other by just uh, uh, comparing the hash. So let's see. OK, this doesn't work again. Uh, I'm going to have to go back to the Explorer again. Let's see this one. OK, so we're now going to create a Bitcoin block at least a very uh, stripped down version. We're going to have transaction. Now uh, let's do five transactions. Transaction one is, uh, say, uh, 100 euros. Transaction two is uh, 200 euros. Well, you get the idea. It's just the transactions that are being sent over the network. I'm just filling this in randomly. The idea is 
if I'm going to change something. Okay. So let's see. Where's my hash? Okay. I don't see the actual perform hash button. My apologies, let's do it over here. So let's do it like this, transaction. I'm going to do five transactions. So let's keep it a bit more simple. It's going to be a bit random. All right. So we have data, right? It's just a random data set. And Bitcoin in the Bitcoin network, transactions are sent all the time and they are collected into blocks. So how, the, how does this work? Well, if you have these transactions and you hash them using SHA-256, the algorithm Bitcoin uses, you get a value. And if you can see, if you just remember the first four characters and the last five characters of the last four characters or something around that, you can do three. So it's 72C9 and it ends on 2296E. So it doesn't matter where in the world you perform this SHA-256 hash on this data. So if you check the same transaction data and you hash it, you get this, ex same, this exact same value. So 72, C, 94, etc. So this is how each node in a network checks if we all have the same data. Because if we all have the same transactions in a block and we hash this block, we should get the same value. And it also protects the network from someone you know, trying to uh, corrupt this data. Because, for instance, it would be interesting for me if I could do this, uh, 15,000 euros. Uh, if, if, it, if this would be a transaction to my account, this would be an interesting attack to be able to do, to just change the data that is in the block. But now, if I hash this value, and I've, I've just added a few zeros, I don't know if you, if, if you notice it, but it's a completely different value. And it, it is different even if you change one thing. So if I just delete one interpunction uh, character here, so just this one, remove it, hash it again, it's completely different. So this is one of the uh, characteristics, characteristics of cryptographic hash function. Each unique input will, will result in a different output. So the Bitcoin network uses this to check in order if you all have the same data. So these are some important cryptographic principles to keep in mind as we, uh, as we continue. So what happens now? And this is why it's called the blockchain. So now we know what blocks are. It's just a set, a data set of transactions that have been sent over the network. And now transactions are collected into blocks. So we have just seen such a block, right, with transactions in it, and they are hashed. So if you can see the um, block 23, all the way on the left, the entire block is hashed, and this hash is used as an, as an input for the next block. You see it in block 24, all the way in the top, there's the hash of block 23. So there's the new transactions that are, that are uh, put into block 24, and that is hashed which is then the input for block 25. So you see that the previous hash is always the input for the next, for the next block. And this is how the blocks are chained together. So if you would change anything at any point, it would be, see, it would be immediately visible throughout the chain of blocks. So if, if everything goes correctly, and all the hashes and all the, the blocks are the same, so each, each uh, node has a copy of the blockchain and what they do is they constantly check do we have the same data so they are constantly hashing the blocks and checking them so at, in this in this situation everyone has exact the, exactly the same data and now we try to change some data now, transaction y just like i did in the in the hashing function before is is changed and this will change the hash of block 23 and the hash of block 23 is an input for block 24 and that is hashed and that value will also change. So because, just because I 
changed one single transaction, transaction Y in block 23, all the hash values of everything that comes after will change. So if an attacker, and you see that guy with the hat is clearly a, a malicious agent on the network, he tries to change something in block number two, and this will result in different hashes than the other people have. Because he tried to do what I just did, you know, change a transaction from, say, uh, 100 euros to 100,000 euros. This would be a tremendous financial gain, if this were possible. But because everyone has a copy of all the transactions that are ever uh, sent across the network, and everyone is checking if the blocks contain the same data by hashing them, you can see that the integrity of the data is intact. And if someone at any point tries to change anything, just a single transaction, just a point or a decimal change, will be visible in his entire version of the blockchain and he will be banned from the network. So this is how the, how the uh, cryptography works uh, on a transactional level. So let's dive a little bit more into this. So this is kind of the, the process, right? In cryptography, you, also, you always have Bob and Alice. If you have an attacker, it's mostly Oscar. Um, so if you see an Oscar somewhere, he's probably an attacker. Um, and Bob wants to send two Bitcoin to Alice. So what he does is he, 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 has, his, uh, uh, he has his Bitcoin node on his, on his machine um, where he can uh, construct a transaction. So he constructs a transaction, he uh, enters Alice's public key because that is her bank account number on the Bitcoin network. And he wants to send two Bitcoin to her. So this transaction is relayed throughout the entire network. It takes a couple of milliseconds for a single transaction to be permeated all over the globe. And each active node on the Bitcoin network will have seen this transaction. But it is not, at that point, entered into the blockchain. And that is where the miners come in. If you remember, the, these guys are looking for a certain solution, uh, a certain puzzle they are solving. They are looking for a specific, specific number of zeros in their hash value. So these miners take uh, Bob's transaction is one of many transactions. They end up in a memory pool of transactions. And miners grab transactions out of this memory pool, put them into a block, and hash this block. And once they find uh, a, a valid hash value, they can actually create a valid block, and uh, the block is uh, sent to all the other nodes. So this is basically the process. Let's, let's look at it step by step. So Bob constructs a transaction. He enters Alice's destination address, the amount of Bitcoin, uh, his, uh, his own addresses, you can have as many addresses as you want. So we will need to speci specify which addresses do I want to use to send these two Bitcoin. Could be that one address has 0 0.5 Bitcoin, another one 0 0.52, and another address 1 Bitcoin. So if he uses all three addresses as an input for his transaction, he can send out two Bitcoin. And if he wants uh, to have a valid transaction, he needs to uh, present a signature, and that's where the private key come in comes in. We are using the private key, you can sign your transactions. And that's, uh, that's uh, by doing that, the network can check if you are actually the, the, the owner of the Bitcoin. So he sends out the transaction, and it needs to uh, meet a certain number of criteria. So does this data have the right format? Uh, each Bitcoin transaction has a specific way of being uh, constructed, and Bob just needs to meet these criteria. So you have the amount that it needs to be set in a certain data type and et cetera. Uh, is there enough money in the addresses Bob has used? If he doesn't own two Bitcoin, the transaction will be uh, denied. Uh, does Bob have valid digital signatures for all the addresses? So for, uh, as, you, as we have seen, uh, a key pair generator generates a public key, which is the address, and a private key that accompanies this uh, uh, address so he will need to prove that he has the private key for these addresses. So you can generate a signature, and by presenting this signature, others can compute if you actually have the valid private key. And um, by using signatures, you never have to actually give out your private key, because that would be bad, right? If you give your private key away, anyone else could, could send away your Bitcoin. So for this, we use digital signatures. So Bob can prove that he is actually the possessor of the private key, without having to give away the private key. And he does this by computing a signature. 
And the, uh, the last check is, is uh, Alice's address valid? I mean, it's, it's really nice that you know, the software has been maturing for a couple of years because the very first implementations of the software uh, did not have uh, this check. So you could enter a wrong address and your money would be gone. So then uh, the is transaction enters into the mempool and the minus wait for it. Um, and now in the mempool, you see Bob's transaction to Alice is in the memory pool. So miners take these transactions and start computing, looking for this specific value. So how does this look? This is what they're basically doing. A block has a version field. It has a previous block hash, as we've seen. There's a miracle root, that's a cryptographic uh, uh, element. There's a timestamp, right? It happened at a certain time. Uh, there's the difficulty target. That is the, 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 the value that, 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 that changes as computing power increases. It becomes more difficult to find this uh, uh, solution to the puzzle. And there is a nonce. And a nonce stands for number once, and this is a random number. So uh, the first transaction is always the coin-based transaction. Uh, what does a coin-based transaction mean? This is the mining reward. So when a miner tries to construct a valid block, the very first transaction he enters is his reward, right? Because he actually, uh, if he succeeds in, in finding a valid block, this is the transaction he wants, and this is how he gets the reward, and then all the other transactions. So really the only way miners can vary the data in this, uh, in this block is by changing the random number. So they are just con constantly, uh, because the transactions are the same, Time is about the same. I mean, these machines can do millions of hashes per second. So uh, unless you are going to have a nano clock or something integrated, it's going to be difficult to use a timestamp as a, as a random uh, input or, or as a changeable input. So they basically just change the random number all the time and, 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 and try to find the valid number. Uh, as soon as they have a, a valid block, they relay it. Uh, it also has a couple of uh, checks. Does the block have the right format? It's a block reward in the Coinbase transaction accurate. You could try to dupe the system. Uh, 12 and a half Bitcoin is, is, is what's allow, uh, what the mining reward is now. If you try to make that of 125, your block will be denied. Um, do all the transactions meet the verification standard? And is the puzzle uh, solution valid? So now block number 10 is the, trans is the block where uh, Bob's transaction to Alice is, um, is, is in. And as soon as it's valid, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, attached to the blockchain. So it's on top of block 9 and 8. And each uh, subsequent block is put on top of the block where Bob and Alice's transaction is in. And it gets more and more difficult to actually change the data in these blocks as, as the blockchain grows. So mining Bitcoin happens by miners taking a set of transactions and uh, changing the, the, the random number, the nonce, and they do it uh, as long as uh, they or someone else find uh, a valid, uh, a valid uh, output of this uh, so they can create a block. Um, and this is basically how the proof of work works. So you need to have computational power in order to create valid blocks. So this is what makes the Bitcoin network uh, uh, secure, but also unique. This is the way by, by adding CPU into the, into the equation, uh, you, you have to actually own CPU and you have to perform computations in order to uh, create valid blocks. So only people that actually uh, expend a significant, significant number of effort um, uh, can create valid blocks. And their incentive uh, to do this correctly is because they want the mining reward. So they are constantly computing, and this is the inst incentive structure that makes Bitcoin quite unique. Uh, the miners want to remain honest. There could be a majority that tries to dupe the system, but this will probably cost more money than they could earn in returns by actually being an honest node. So the purpose of Bitcoin mining is ensuring currency is brought into circulation. Uh, this mining reward, this is how Bitcoins are created. We are now at about 18 million, and there will be 21 million. And it is uh, calculated that the last Bitcoin will be uh, created around 2150. So we probably won't, uh, won't be there to, uh, to witness this. Um, but this is how big Bitcoin is uh, brought into circulation. Um, it ensures that only transactions which meet, which meet verification standards are validated. And this prevents the double spending problem. 
because now not just anyone can enter data into the blockchain. Basically, it can be anyone, but you have to have expanded a significant number of CPU cycles. And this is what makes Bitcoin really interesting uh, in, in, in the sense of value. Uh, lots of people say Bitcoin has no value, it's a bubble and, and, and all that. But these machines, this CPU power, uh, this is something concrete, something that, is, that you can actually point at uh, that, that brings Bitcoin its, its security. Because mining increases the security. Because as there is more comput computing power in the network, uh, you would have to match this computing power, and, and uh, we're talking about millions and millions of, uh, of hashes per second. Um, we're going to show some value uh, a bit later. Uh, but it's, it's, you would need to match all the computing power that is currently uh, uh, calculating for the Bitcoin network. And the, this mining farm you saw, there are uh, hundreds of these all around the world. So anyone who wants to uh, attack the system and to, uh, to enter data that is not correct would have to match all this computational power. And well, if you, if you calculate it, you would, need, well, you would need about a billion dollars to start because you would need to buy hardware, you would need to hire people, you would need to, to uh, buy for the, for the power it consumes. Um, basically, it's more profitable to just buy Bitcoin if you have, uh, if you have a billion dollars to spend. So the value will increase as the security increases, because people now know that there's a, a, you know, a secure way to, to store their assets. And as the value increases, more miners are incentivized to also buy these machines, which increases the security again, which will increase the value again. So this is the Bitcoin triad of security. And this is, at least in my opinion, where, where the, the, the actual value, of course there is a, you know, there is a, a percentage of speculation, uh, certainly at this, uh, at this time, but the core value of Bitcoin is the, is the amount of CPU power. These are the newest machines. They, they can do, uh, well, you can see 12.93 terahashes per second. This is just crazy, the, the, the speed these machines have. And this is the, how the network hash, hash rate has evolved over time. So you see all the way in the beginning, this is, this is all time. This is the all time graph. So in January of 2009, it was a you know, really, really small amount. It was people using laptops and desktops. And then these uh, uh, specific machines that were built just to perform hash functions came out and they have evolved in several generations. And so you see it's just exponentially growing. And if you see the hash rate versus the market price, well, this is how I think they are related. There is actually something there that gives this stuff value. And that is the computational power that all these miners all across the world are, are bringing. And not only do these bring the security of the network, they also solve this double spending problem. Uh, uh, that, that, that makes it so that you don't need a third party anymore in order to be sure that once you send out a transaction that it actually happens as you intended to. These miners make sure of this because of these protocol rules. They have to adhere to the rules of the protocol of Bitcoin in order to create uh, a valid block. And they can only do that by performing a certain number of, uh, of, of CPU uh, computations. So it's secured by computation basically. If you, uh, this is the largest supercomputer in the world. If you compare the, the, the hash rate, and it's not really an honest comparison because the supercomputer can perform, uh, it's a Turing complete machine, so it can perform all the computations that are uh, possible. So it can run OSs, uh, do everything you want. Bitcoin cannot, it can only do hashes. But if you see uh, the Sunway Tau light is only 93 petaflops, where Bitcoin is over six, uh, 46 million petaflops. So the amount of uh, computing power on this network is really, really uh, uh, incredible. So, to conclude, let's see this network in action. Uh, okay, this doesn't work as well. <laughs> let's do a workaround again. Uh, this is a live map of the Bitcoin network. Um, and you can see this is live. So these are transactions that are happening uh, uh, at this point. You see it's all over the world. And what Bitcoin basically made possible is a, is a totally distributed computing uh, global interface. You know, it's just computing power that is out there. And you can just use it. And Bitcoin is, of course, to transact money. And you can just, you know, you can build your transaction and send it to the network. And it will perform it for you. You don't need a payment processor. You don't need a cloud platform. You don't need licenses to do anything. You can just use the network. 
And this is, this is evolving now into a, into a global distributed computing uh, interface that is, that is open, that is public, that is open source. And after Bitcoin in 2015, there, uh, there came Ethereum. And I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Ethereum, but where Bitcoin is uh, only uh, very deterministic, you can only perform a, a, a small set of computations, like addition, you know, subtraction, uh, some division, but you, you cannot really, you can some, do some modulus, but that's about it. You cannot do loops, you cannot do uh, switch cases, you cannot do anything of the more complex functions. But Ethereum, however, is using the same system with miners, checking is the data computed correctly, but Ethereum provides a Turing complete virtual machine. So it is just like Bitcoin, it is a network that is created by people just all over the world uh, buying hardware and pointing this computational power to the network. And where Bitcoin is now stable, uh, sort of stable as a store of value, Ethereum is growing to be uh, the world computer. At least that's how they, how they uh, call their own network. And uh, uh, I, I personally think that this could very well be the next generation after cloud computing. So for cloud, you need, uh, yeah, you need licenses, you need to have an account with Azure or, or whatever. Uh, but with Ethereum, you could just have code and deploy it. And all the, all, the, all the computers all over the world will calculate it for you. And by mining, uh, using the cryptography and the chaining of, of hashes, uh, that, is the, uh, what, uh, well, that is the core of, uh, of blockchain technology. And it makes it possible to, uh, yeah, to, to, to start working on a computer that, that is just there and that is available. And you just send your computation to it and it will do it. Yeah, thank you. This was... Uh, this was the introduction to mining so far. Thank you very much. <laughs>